I am Jim Callison and live from our virtual studios around the world. This is Gallup's Called the Coach, recorded on June 10th, 2020. Called the Coach is a resource for those who want to help others discover and use their strengths. We have Gallup experts and independent strengths coaches share tactics, insights, and strategies to help coaches maximize the talent of individuals, teams, and organizations around the world. If you're listening live, love to have you join us in our chat room. Uh, right above me, actually, is a link. If you're on our live page, so if you're at gallup.com slash cliftonstrengths slash live, right above me is a link to the YouTube instance that has the chat room embedded in it. Many of you made it over there, but if you haven't yet, click on that link. Love to have you in our chat, you can ask questions live. We'll be watching that as well. If it's after the fact and you missed the chat, it's okay. You can send us an email, coaching at gallup.com. Don't forget, if you're on YouTube down below there, there's a little subscribe button. If you subscribe now, you get a notification whenever we post something new. Hit the notification bell and hit all so you make sure you get all the ones that they publish. And then don't forget, this is a podcast as well. So any podcast app, just search Gallup Webcasts and you'll see all the podcasts that are available. Dr. Adam Hickman is our host today. Adam's Gallup's content manager and one of my best friends at work. Adam, welcome to Called the Coach. Thanks, Jim. Great to be back. Well, we have a fabulous guest today. Why don't you take a second and introduce him? Sure. Dr. Ben Wigger is with us today. He's our director of research and strategy at Gallup for Gallup's workplace management practice. Uh, Dr. Wigger has a set, has assessment of talent management needs, designs for employee experiences, strategies, uh, really for organizations across the globe. Um, Ben's an IO psychologist by trade and specializes in helping organizations improve their talent acquisition, their development, their engagement, and their performance management. We're going to talk a little bit more about those pieces here in a sec. Uh, his most recent work, so if, if you read our articles, and I hope you do, if you're subscribed to the Gallup at Work newsletter, you're going to see things coming out with his name attached to it, really tied to burnout, the manager experience. So what are the perks and what I would say non-perks of the job? How do you help your managers through those? How do you coach through there? And then one of my all-time favorite papers that we have out there is the re-engineering performance management. Uh, Ben's top five is achiever, strategic, ideation, analytical, and input. And to give Ben a little re recognition here, you will hear analytical today like you have never heard before. Uh, we get in trouble, ideation is my number one. I, I think that's where we end up in long conversations and I wait for Ben's Achiever to say like, okay, so now what do we do? In which direction are we going? And by all means, when I think of input, Ben, I, I've, I would say I've seen this, but what I think you provide to the world is your input of what you've researched and what you've contributed and no difference today, we're gonna get into that exact topic. So Ben, welcome. Thanks guys, pleasure to be here. Ben, good to have you. Hey, let's do a quick little focus on you. How long have you been at Gallup and what's your favorite part of the job that you do? Oh man, that's a, those are the hardest. I hope that's the hardest question of the yeah, day. Yeah, um, for sure. Jim, I've been here for um, almost eight years now. And my favorite part is I get to uh, research what's on the minds of employees every day. And I get to um, help organizations all over the world improve that employee experience. So, um, you know, it's gratifying to me to see organizations improve, managers improve, individuals improve. And I'm like Adam said, I'm, I'm a huge nerd. So getting to spend my day in the data and the writing, um, you know, that's that's the, the best day at work for me, for sure. Yeah, I think for some listeners, they're going to sympathize with that. <laughs> they really enjoy that, that analytical piece as well and the research that goes into it. It's a pretty it's a pretty magical job when we get the right person and the right fit who enjoys that research would not be my favorite thing to do right all day. I love to do this, but of course it's my job to make you guys a big deal and to really highlight the work that we do. So Ben, thanks for, uh, for joining us today, Adam, we're going to start with you and, and we know uh, performance reviews are really, are really hard for most managers. Sure. And as we think about the audience, uh, primarily coaches and a lot of our certified coaches, but we may have some managers in here. We're going to speak to you as well. Um, these often don't get done very well. And they are, managers don't like doing them and employees don't like getting them. And there's lots of things. We're going to kind of highlight that as we talk about that today. Um, we've spent, not not new to us, we have spent a bunch of time over the last couple of years um, really researching this, looking into it, writing about it. Um, and so I'm excited today to kind of bring that. Adam, bring some numbers, and then we're going to quiz Ben on these numbers as well. Bring some <laughs> numbers to the equation. What do we know about this, when this, this idea of a progress review? What do we know about it? 
Yeah, it's a great point. And it's June. So it's progress review time, right? We're halfway through. We're going to get to, to what the win that is as well. And as you think of the folks that are joint coming back to the workplace or maybe staying still remote, the idea is not to stop having progress reviews, although the conversation likely is to change. And if you've been a part of a progress review, if you've led one, hopefully it wasn't just communicating metrics and correcting problems, but it was more of how do you have an engaging developmental conversation that's grounded uh, really in the, the well-rounded view of their performance expectations that matter most to you, to them. That's a key piece to that. So if you think of um, Jim's question of how are we doing today? Let's give, let's give some perspective here. 19% of employees strongly agree that they have re that they reviewed their greatest success with their manager in the past six months. If you've read our our, um, our research, if you've been a part of the Gallup uh, the brand and things that we say, or if you've read it's the manager similar to what's on, on Ben's hat, you know that we anchor a lot in past success. Why? Well, it's back to Don Clifton's about what are we aiming at? We're aiming at success. So how do you get the most out of that in a progress review? Ideally, you anchor that conversation and we're going to give you some helpful conversation starters today on a past success or success. So 19% is where we're at. Only 21% of employees strongly agree that their performance metrics are within their control. So if you think of those managers, those leaders that you're coaching around performance metrics, it'd be interesting to say, how many of these are within your span of control? Knowing on the other side of that, the percentage, only 21% strongly agree. Ben, anything more you want to add to that or recent statistics that we have? You know, the thing, Adam, that strikes me the most about uh, progress reviews is if we start with their purpose, it's really to to inspire and improve performance, right? I mean, if we really kept it tight on what do we need to get done, we need to get better um, and help people get excited about being better, know how to get better, right? So a, a stat that jumps out to me the most is after um, most performance reviews, that doesn't happen. People are actually less engaged and, and performance doesn't improve. So about a third of the time, performance actually improves after a performance review. About a third of the time, there's no effect. Performance stays the same. And about a third of the time, performance actually gets worse. Uh, so that kind of tells you right there that that's failing the, the purpose. Ben, how, how close is this tied in our Q12 assessment? I know it's expected of me as the very first question. How, how close do these tie and what do we know about the two of them? Yeah, I think, Jim, I think engagement performance and development are so interwoven. If they don't work together, they're not fully working to their capability and potentially against each other too, right? So like you should always be able to approach your job and your performance in a way that's engaging, strengths-based and continually developing you. Right. So part of um, engagement, especially the way we define engagement, is being prepared to perform, um, being enabled to perform and quickly identifying barriers to that performance. So, I mean, they go hand to hand, in my opinion. I mean, if you're not doing things in an engaging manner that, that moves the needle, you're, you're not really getting it done. Well, why is that so hard? You know, you'd think you hired somebody. And you'd think you'd hired them because you knew what you wanted them to do. Why is that so hard to the, the disconnect between that of, I know what I, as a manager, I know what you need to do. And then mm -hmm. I need to tell you that. Why, where, why is that so hard? Where, where's the disconnect on that between the manager and, and their employee? Yeah, that, you know, that's an amazing question. We had a, a really, a really fun conversation this morning um, about, um, some areas where an organization is doing a good job of selecting high talent people, good fit to roll and things like that, but they're working on um, continually getting better at, at jobs, projects, any specific task related things. So even when you have someone who is the right person for the right job, and even when they're engaged, um, you still have to get really clear on those expectations and those changing expectations and what's needed to support them. So I think that's the hard thing is even when you perfectly have the right person and they're engaged, you still have to point them um, at, at what they need to achieve and how that gets achieved in a way we're all we're all moving the ball together, if you will. Mm -hmm. So that that's the tricky part is it's not a one time conversation. It's not a metric. It's not a one off. It's an ongoing conversation. Um, and it has to be had in a way that's not only making us effective, but also is meaningful um, to that person in a very individualized way. 
Yeah, part of the part of the manager's role, and we, we you know we we talk about this, and it's the manager is all the pressures they're under. We know our frontline managers, at least here in the United States, are some of the le- most least engaged employees in a lot of organizations because they're getting hammered both from below and above. Uh, their their managers are hammering them. They're getting hammered by the folks they're trying to manage. Right? What kind of advice as we as, as we think about frequency of this, Ben? Like how maybe this is part of the problem is they're sure. not happening frequently enough. What do, what do we recommend these conversations from a frequency standpoint? Yeah. So yeah, I think you hit the bottom line there too, is that like work is dynamic, right? It's not static, especially um, times like these when things are constantly changing and where to identi- quickly identify and opportunities and issues and things like that. Like we need to sync up performance management to more fit how work actually happens. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, you know, I know you've had previous series on the five conversations and that, and that helps you get there. Right. If you're doing your quick connect, you're informally understanding what's going on in that employee's world. If you're doing that check in um, at least once or twice a month to really know what's on their plate what their priorities are um, and, and what these short and long-term goals are. Now we're making a lot of progress right there. Those are the things that are happening now are the quick connects and the check-ins um, where we're focused on the, the priorities and expectations now and how they affect our long-term goals. Um, and then we would also say you need to have a formal progress re- review at least twice a year. We see a lot of clients actually moving the three or four times a year, often quarterly, um, because that's forcing that's forcing conversations about where we're at at least three or four times a year. And if you think about it, waiting every three or four months to talk about where we're at is still a really long time. So if we're not having those every day, every week, every month conversations that we need, it, it's still not enough. But what they're trying to do by forcing more frequent um, progress reviews is they're trying to ensure we're at least checking in on progress and adjustments we need to make. Um, three or four times a year. And some of the very best are even taking this beyond the manager and individual one-on-one. They're taking it also to the team. So they're bringing along the team and the employee at the same time. Yeah, I I actually, I feel like sometimes this is not getting modeled by the executive team to their managers. So they're not, those managers are not getting these regular check-ins, the quick connects, those, right? It's not being modeled to them. And so they're not seeing a positive example that could be modeled uh, down to to the the work the team the work teams the employees the the folks they're working with right that whole that 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 whole process is is being short circuited we expected it from frontline managers but maybe not at the executive level do we know anything mm-hmm. about that yeah I mean you hit it on the head there like so think about think about the problem right like if we if we just set a goal at the beginning of the year and it may or it may not be a super well informed goal and we pursue it all year without any consideration of what else is you know the changes yeah. in your expectations changes in your clients changes in your um your team or frankly just how things are going and if we hold people accountable to that goal and we pay put a lot of money on that put the chips on that people are naturally going to keep striving for that and not make adjustments so to your point that's where the onus comes on. And I say onus, really it's collaboration between the individual and the manager to make those adjustments. But it starts with the manager saying, I expect you to help make these adjustments. Mm-hmm. We're setting these goals in a collaborative manner. We're adjusting them in a collaborative manner. I'm, if you will, giving you permission and I'm asking you to let me know when something needs to change and we'll talk about it. Um, it starts starts with the manager and leadership modeling that. I mean, you can't have agility. Um, you can't have agility, innovation, inclusiveness, any of those things if you're not listening and opening the channel and setting that as an expectation of having a two-way conversation, right? It starts there, but you have to actually make that happen and not just tell them. You know, I mean, the, the thing that, <clears throat> the classic thing I see is people give people a one-pager and say, hey, talk more often. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just too big to ask if that's not how we've been doing things. So you have to work really hard at creating a new rhythm of conversations. Yeah, we, we know in the steps of creating a strengths-based culture, right? We know that executive buy-in is super important in, in understanding the, of this thing moving forward. And I also think when we think about performance reviews in these conversations, that's also another area where it's got to, it has to have support uh, throughout both up, up and down the organization or however sideways if your organization is, <laughs> is laid out that way, however you want to define that. Um, and so uh, the, the executive team buy-in of understanding this collaborative approach to making sure that goals go up and down 
um, as well, you know, right? Yeah, I mean, to your point, Jim, it, it's, it's <clears throat> excuse me, it becomes a cultural thing, really, right? Yeah. So, I mean, we can't just make it a tactic that lives in a performance management process. Like, we need leadership to get behind it and say, this is what we believe in. This is how we work together. This is how we achieve our values and meet our customer needs and be innovative and agile and those things you want to be and adaptive and resilient. Um, if they don't come out and say that's important, so we're going to change how we work together and kind of create that shared accountability for working that way, it continues just to be a performance management tactic um, owned by HR that even if we increase it from once a year to four times a year, um, it's still a checkbox, right? Yeah. And not part of how we work. Yeah, I, I know for me, the longer I let my budget go, the harder it is to come back to it. Like I get less and less motivated as the days go on because I know I got to play all this catch up and it's painful. I think it's similar in, in performance reviews and that the longer you go without employees being talked to about that or managers being talked to about that, the harder that conversation becomes, the less likely you are to have it. And so mm -hmm. we, we recommend at least one to three that that number depends on the organization. But Adam, as we think about this session, based on uh, resources that we have available, we published an article last month about uh, getting progress reviews right. We tailored it to uh, the COVID-19 situations happening now. But really, performance management doesn't span across pandemics or crises. This needs to be done good or bad times. For coaches, what kind of what other resources do we have available? You're our content. Uh, lead on this? What else is available for them? Yeah, I love the question of when, because usually that comes up really quick. When do I have these? Uh, the short answer of it is, well, if you're working with an organization, ideally they have a system set up to say the when, just to show that you've had that conversation. But if somebody asks me, when should I have progress reviews? I'd say often and frequent, because it, think of the term optics, right? So you've gone six, seven months without a performance conversation progress review. They know their performance and their progress, and now they're waiting to validate, does my manager know this? Okay, so flip the script on that. There's been an ongoing check-in, there's ongoing conversations uh, where you don't necessarily need to say, uh, the next 15 minutes is all gonna be about progress review, but you've intertwined some questions, some comments on there that shows past success, that you've kind of invited the conversation around progress review. And whether, um, Sabrina, I saw your question in there about part-time or, or gig workers, that's things you can still have both either or because it's based on success. It's based on the past to help to predict, to show as you make progress, right? Let's use Ben's top five. If we're having a progress review, I'd probably be curious to learn about achievers number one, Ben, tell me about a most recent success you've had achieving something, right? I've now invited his talents into the conversation. I'm including him, but in a way that's going to trigger a response where I might not get the mic back because that's going to take off <laughs> on an achiever piece to it, right? And I'm going to hear those pieces of those that talents just fall right out. You don't need to wait to schedule that on a calendar with an invite that says progress review for 30 minutes. It could be any conversation. It could be on Monday. It could be on Tuesday. It doesn't matter when. The idea is that we know, and based on our science, Ben, back to change if you need to, at least twice per year as ideal, right? And normally organizations have a system set up that dictates you must have this done by now. But if you ask me when, I, I don't, I don't see why you can't have these interwoven through all sorts of conversations. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk about these three things, these three yeah. items to kind of focus on here in just a second. But Adam, let me re-ask that question for you. What other resources do we have available to yeah. them? What are we posting? What's available to them right now? Sure. Uh, the re-engineering performance management paper is a really good start. It's got some pieces in there to show you about what are the five conversation models that we're talking about we've brought up. Um, ben, ben has helped build and facilitate those conversations of what those are, almost down to the timing of them that you'll hear as well. That's one really great re resource. Uh, the article we just talked about was really anchored and, and focused in on progress reviews. Uh, even down to courses that Gallup offers around the five conversations model that we have, you'll see a course out there now for Boss to Coach that we offer open. And then for enterprises, for organizations, we have a, a Boss to Coach journey course that really helps ingrain all these principles that we have going across as well. Other pieces that we have out there, you know, you've got to get into the roots of what this is. So if you think of conversations, look for the articles you have or email me, I'll, I'm happy to find them for you about, you know, we, we say conversations and usually the, the word meaningful pops up in front of that. 
we've given resources out there to say, well, what does meaningful actually mean to, to your specific person? The short answer of it is ask them, right? But we've got research to say for millennials, it's this and then so on and so forth. So there's, there's pieces that are out there for that as well too, Jim. Awesome. Appreciate you doing that. Let's dig in on the, the on these three items, Ben, when we think about each one of them, in other words, being achievement oriented, fair, uh, inaccurate and developmental. Talk a little bit about that first one, achievement oriented. It seems intuitive at, on the surface. Is there more to it than that? Yeah, no, that, that's it's, it's the right place to start, really, because if you think about what's gone wrong with them, it. Um, progress reviews are famous for leading with criticism and first and only telling you what you did wrong, right? So you're right, it sounds simple, but we naturally don't start there, right? So the, the whole idea here is if we can positively frame it to things that are successful, positive, future-oriented, we've immediately changed the conversation, we've reduced defensiveness, and we've helped people start to own and think about what their best looks like. And maybe that's the most interesting trick in the whole thing. If we start with the successes, like Adam said, if we pull out successful moments where I can identify my strengths and great partnerships, I can really set the tone for what works for me, my talent, my expectations. And if we contrast that with what hasn't worked so well, we can then pull out how can I use my strengths and partnerships um, to be more successful in those moments. And if we set the tone right there, the difficult part of the conversation becomes easier. So when we start to candidly address some issues we need to get into, we're able to say, what could your best look like here? Because people tend to naturally push themselves um, further and harder than you ever could in the first place. So just by even making that a question rather than the accusation of, you know, is, is this our best work here? Is this your best work here? What could that look like? You've completely flipped it where we can be candid about this didn't go well. We need to work on this. Or I, I, I see you I'm growing this way. Um, it, it just opens it up um, for a more constructive approach if we start with, what's working and i'll even just say this like pr progress reviews are famous for talking about everything except for um what employees actually spend the majority of their time doing because you end up talking to the form and the metrics and then employees classically say geez we talked about everything except for what i actually do every day mm -hmm. and that extra discretionary effort and those big impacts so just by opening up here we can make it more dynamic and more grounded in in their job and their successes so that we can achieve those more often. Then how important is it to to lead this conversation with strengths? And it, we did this with you, uh, Adam kind of did this with you coming in as we were introducing you. How important is that matter in, the, in a manager maybe knowing the individual strengths of the of the individual? It really, it really breathes life into the conversation. You know, if you use strength small s and just what do we do best, that, that's really good, it's helpful, but we still all have a little bit different language and we're not necessarily bringing out those consistent themes and places where we can invest. So when we bring in Clifton strengths, that helps a ton because we really understand the individual. Um, if you're the if you're the manager and you know their strengths, you may even adjust your delivery mechanism. For it were me, you may bring in some proof and some data and some, some specific facts, right? Because you know that's gonna resonate with me. Um, for other people who are really emotionally tied into it, you may lead more with purpose um, and, and things they wanna accomplish, but Clifton Strengths is really a supercharger. We see it in the data, by the way. We see a huge lift, not just from ongoing conversations, but actually adding strengths to it. Um, you know, so it's, it's an evidence-based best practice. But I mean, really, it is your code book for making these human. And kind of the last thing I'll say is we work with businesses that um, they brought in a, a really good new performance management process, um, but it wasn't humanized. And they told us that. They're like, we need an accelerator. Like, we were recommending the right frequency. We have good conversation guides, but our managers don't know how to talk to our people in a highly individualized way that gets the most out of them. And, that, and that's where we need your help. Adam, based on our research, would you add anything to that? It'd be great if Ben could show some more signs of analytical. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we could get more of that out of him. I tried to program a robot for this call, but the machine <laughs> learning and natural language processing is still still insufficient. I just, um, no, I think Ben's covered the basis. The piece that I'd add to it, and I'll, I'll end with some questions before we can continue on going forward with it, is that who doesn't want to start with a past success? When it's achievement oriented, focusing on the achievement orients you for the future of what's 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 the most challenging that's around it. Because you get to say in here, 
these are the things that that had past success. So how do you replicate that with a different task, a different project to motivate them going forward? And it's a conversation. It's free. We didn't charge you for that. <laughs> like you just you totally. just have these conversations. Jim, okay, if we move on to the questions to ask. Yeah, let's let's think. So this is an area where coaches can help managers. So coaches, as you're listening, if you're a manager, just take the questions. But coaches, these are questions we're giving to you to say you can pass these along to the managers you're coaching as an opportunity to help them with those that they're 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 managing and doing the performance management with. So Adam, you want to roll through those questions for us? Yeah, you got it. And the best part is is you have to think through how these questions unpack the answer. So if you're high analytical or competition, you're racing to get the question in there and then you're anticipating the response and like you've you've already heard the conversation, you even asked the question. What I'm asking you is don't do that. <laughs> Use this question and see where the conversation goes. Here's three really to get you grounded in the achievement oriented. The first one is kind of what we've already talked about. In the past six months, what's the best recognition you've ever received? If you ask yourself that, you can see how that starts to unpack, uncover all of those things we've talked about, about strengths and past success and how you can use that. That's a really good one to, to get out there for achievement oriented. Uh, two more, the metrics, you know, what metrics provide the best gauge of your success? If you think in the, in the um, just achievement oriented, you're asking a question that shows that we are going to hold you accountable because that's what we're here for, but also it's a gauge of your success. That way, if you're not quote unquote having a progress review, they're still able to look at their objective measurements to see how's the success going. Right. So when you ask that question of what's the best recognition, an A plus answer I think would be great is not only that, but you can gauge it based on uh, past metrics as well. And the last one here, who are your partners that bring out the best of you? If you've read our power of two, or if you've have done any digging, or even if not, if you're brand new to this, you know there are some that some others that just make you shine because of that difference and deficiency of, of where you're at on your, you know, one through thirty-four. And in our world, how do you, you know, with 34 being empathy for me, I know I've got questions I've got to ask coming out of meetings and things that I just count on my partners for that I say, you know, for me to be achievement oriented every day, I know that it's not always going to rely on me and that there are other partners that can help me achieve that as well and help me kind of build some parameters around how do I do that. So those, those are the three questions for that one. Ben, before we move on to the next one, would you add anything to that? So interesting data point, and no, you're going to be surprised. I'm going to drop a data point. Um, we looked, at, we looked at our exit data, and we saw that about half of the people who left their company um, said that something could have been done to prevent them from leaving. So, hy hypothetically, half of voluntary turnover is preventable according to that stat. We dug deeper and looked even closer at that. Half of the people who voluntarily left also said that their manager had not talked to them about their progress, their achievements, or their engagement in the previous three months leading up to their departure. Okay, so obviously this is the right thing to do to inspire performance, but it's also the reason people will kind of disengage and leave and when we're, when we're not dialing into um, their goal progress, their developmental progress, um, and how I can get better. I think that other number too is that managers account for up to 70% of an employee's engagement sure. in that, right? So really, really important that our managers are armed with this uh, information as well. Um, so we we think about some great questions to ask, right? Get, get diving in and making sure this is achievement oriented, successfully driven, positive in its focus to begin with. Then it's really important that it's fair and accurate. So Ben, talk a little bit about what does that mean fair and accurate? Yeah, so those are the things that we have found um, to be the most disengaging about performance reviews for people is, is in, that's in their words, it's in our survey data, I don't feel that it's fair and accurate. Well, if we unpack that a little bit, they don't feel like it represents their job well. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it's within their span of control. Sometimes it doesn't feel like the standards they're being compared to are fair compared to other people's. And that's a natural thing in measurement. The more we standardize it, and make it consistent across the less right it is for an individual person right so there's a little bit of art there of like you don't want different rules for different people but the exact same expectations for people that are in apples to oranges situations don't make sense either so that that's kind of the crux of it um, a big part of this too is, is it still goes back to clarifying your expectations in the first place and what success looks like what's done look like what does good look like um 
and, and then it kind of folds into the evidence we use to actually show where we landed on that criteria, right? So if we start to look at things, there is no one magic metric, right? Um, the thing you hear the most about is there's a lot of manager bias and judgment and things like that. But the truth is it's a combination. The truth is there's a combination of outcomes and behaviors um, that get you to what successful performance looks like, right? So when we set a goal, we're trying to make it, you know, time-based, quality-based, outcome-based, things like that. But there's no one, there's no one metric. So we have to agree ahead of time what does success look like, how is it measured, and and the better evidence I bring to bear to prove that the the better. Because then you'll see things where like maybe the outcome looks good, but the way they got there what was ugly. Um, maybe the outcome wasn't what we expected, but something happened preventing them from getting there and they showed all the right behaviors. Those are the tricky conversations. The easy conversations are when the outcome's good and the behaviors are good or they're both bad because that is what it is. Um, and it just warrants more conversation when those don't align. So anyway, I think my, my main point here is that it has to make sense for them in the role. They have to agree to it ahead of time. And you really want to clearly define what success looks like. And the further you are from doing any of those things, um, the less fair that's going to fill. And if you throw pay on top of that, it's going to be even worse than that, right? So like pay is kind of like throwing gas on the fire if you're not setting clear expectations and, and measuring effectively. Let's, let's talk about that pay piece for a second, because most organizations manage fiscally on an annual basis. I think it kind of made sense that this, this conversation always popped up once a year and it always popped up around budgeting time. What's wrong with the once a year system, Ben? Yeah. And that's the thing. It ends up getting reverse engineered. So even it's a well-intended system, but people know pay matters the most. So sometimes they'll give the rating to justify the pay, actually. Um, we don't see a strong correlation between amount of pay and performance. We see that it affects whether people join a company or leave a company, but it doesn't necessarily translate to performance because there's also a lot of intrinsic motivation built into that too. Um, so the trickiest thing with pay is the more you put on a single target, the more you're going to get that behavior. And then there's going to be unintended consequences of not doing the other. So people do want to be able to make a little more money. Of course, they want to be paid fairly. If, if their total compensation or base salary isn't good, this becomes a bigger issue because they rely on their bonus to get there. Um, but let's, let's say it is good in the market. And at that point, what you have to be looking at is, am I over incentivizing a certain behavior at the cost of others? Um, and people do want to be re rewarded for discretionary effort. Um, but they also love their job and are going to work harder to achieve what they're supposed to, um, right, if they, if they see a bright future. So that, that makes it a bit of a balancing act. As an organization at Gallup, we've actually internally separated performance and the pay conversation away from each other. Is that a good recommendation? Great, great recommendations. If you think about it, if they happen at the same time, that employee is sitting there the entire conversation waiting to hear how much they got paid. Yeah. And, and they may not be hearing it. They may become defensive um, or, or, the, or they may not care because if they know they're going to get their pay, they're not really digging into the conversation. So the point there really is having the progress review and making it about goal progress. Like if we can get really focused on your goals, your progress and your development, we're in great shape. And those things carry over to the pay conversation and they inform the pay conversation, um, but they're disruptive to the progress review if they're included. And on top of that, giving pay its, its own conversation leads to other good things. You have a chance to explain the organizational philosophies behind pay, why you got paid what you did now, how you can change that in the future. And it also becomes a little bit of a career planning and development exercise. Uh, and that's just a conversation that deserves its own attention. Many employees think the process is unfair because they're not maybe something that happened in February yeah. is being talked about in November, right? If, if we think about that, does that happen? And are we seeing that in the all, all the time? I mean, it's that that recency frequency thing is a, is a real problem. Um, I would say to your point too about fairness and accuracy, um, they actually may agree with you that we didn't achieve things quite how we wanted to. And then if they're pay is docked right away right there, then they may feel the whole thing's unfair. Where in reality, if we talk about it separately, we could agree that this didn't go well. And then the pay conversation can be separate about, so did that, am I now getting paid less because that didn't go well? Are we agreeing to co-own that it wasn't just that person, it was a bigger thing. Um, but when you separate those, we can be more clear about what happened, 
the goal progress, and then separately, how does that translate to pay? And of course, of course it's going to carry over, right? If you have performance goals. Um, but when you put it all together, a lot of that unfairness is going to come out in the, I don't, you know, two in 10 people, two in 10 people strongly agree they're paid fairly, two in 10. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, well, and it, it separates a, a, the, the discussion, I think also in sense managers to have the performance conversation more frequently because it's not necessarily going to be a pay conversation right. that's, that's separated. And, and if they're having it more frequently, then there's no surprises, right? We're not coming yep. to the end of the year and saying, Oh, well, sorry, back in February, you did something right. If that's the only time the conversation is right. being had, um, Adam, we've got some questions to help out our coaches or help out our managers as well. What are a yep. few questions we can be asking during this time? Yeah, I was thinking when you said surprises, I was like, no Michael Scott comment. Like, no, no Michael Scott performance reviews. Um, here's some questions I want to throw in front of there, an activity. Because I, I often see in the Facebook site in the community about, hey, what activities can help land this or get this started up? Um, there's an uh, Carl Dunker's the name, German psychologist from the 30s, 40s era. And he had one called the candle problem. If you If you Google it, you'll find it. Um, and it really is around motivators to why and how you do things. This is something you use early on to show intrinsic motivators as a thing. Um, earlier times now, Daniel Pink's kind of picked this up and used it throughout the time period. But if you want to see a really cool activity to use to help land this fair and accurate, that's a really good one that's got years of uh, publications and peer review processes along the way. Questions to ask to land that fair and accurate piece to it is, what would you like to accomplish in your job by working here? And if you have read our millennial research, if you've read pieces of it through It's the Manager, that idea of my job, my life is bigger now more than ever. And if you, when you can hear that, you can, you can hear the response to say, well, knowing what you'd like to accomplish, are you in the right role for this? Is it fair and accurate to say you can achieve that, right, that my life aspect of it in the role that you're in? Another one is, are your priorities clear and do they align with performance goals? Rather than saying, they are clear and they do <laughs> respond with the performance goals. You're inviting that conversation because two key points that I hope that we land in the sticks with folks is that employees, they've got to trust that their assessment of their performance uh, is accurate. One way of doing that is pressure testing as through that type of question. But also managers and leaders as you're coaching them, they've got to use fair, accurate data so they can truly make sense of the experiences that they're having. And you can uncover those things through that type of question. The uh, last one here is, are there things that distract you from being positive, productive, or accurate in your work? And you'll get, you'll, get, you'll get real quick the answer of, do they trust you well enough to answer that? Because it's one way or the other, right? It's, oh, sure, absolutely. I don't want to admit that I'm not positive, productive, or accurate. I always am, 24-7. And I'm not saying that that's not the case. But it invites the conversation to say, are your performance review, are your performance metrics, are they fair and accurate? Those are three questions that will really get to the heart of that. Ben, would you add anything to that? The main thing I would add to it is if we can't tell people how to improve or what better looks like, they're also not going to see it as fair and accurate, right? So everything Adam said is, is, is spot on. And then the big question people have is, um, you know, if, if I want to do better, what does that look like? If mm -hmm. I, um, I want to advance to the next role, get promoted, get paid more, um, change my job responsibilities, you know, what does it look like? So your credibility and progress reviews um, really just vaults when you can clearly define what the next steps should be and what the um, next outcomes look like, because then it becomes a contract that we agree to. This is the progress I need to make next time. Right. And now, now we get the ball rolling. We don't have to sit there and argue about you know, a single metric, a single instance. We can talk about how, how do we get to the next level? Chad in the chat room asked a really good question. Best question so far, by the way, Chad. So I'm giving you some feedback on your on your performance so far. So really good. <laughs> What's the thinking or research Sorry. around how much of the progress review conversation should be documented? Um, in a lot of cases, right? HRs governing this uh, this process and what and how much is just between the manager and the, and the employee? Ben, real quickly, I don't want to go yep. too far off on this, but we have any thoughts on this? Yeah, very organization specific. Where I would start is simple and light. I always try to start with simple and light. It's better they have more have more conversations. I mean, in, in the bigger picture, it doesn't matter what we do during a progress review if we didn't have all the right setup and ongoing conversations. If that review is a surprise, um, 
or if people dread those progress reviews, it doesn't matter because we're not going to get good. It doesn't matter how well your progress review goes because you're not going to get good behavior after that, right? Um, so especially if we're talking like the more frequently you ask them to do something, I would say the less documentation. So if they go like quarterly progress reviews, I would really just make sure they're having the conversation. If they're doing the um, monthly check-in, would really make sure they're just having the conversation. So the first thing we want to do is make that um, productive. You know, give them give them a template, give them training, give them a coaching guide so they know how to have it and they could write it down. But like. I wouldn't require documentation from the organization unless the organization needs it. There are certain roles in organizations that for everything from legal purposes to tracking to what they need to work on requires it. But my general recommendation is go light on the documentation until you really need it. The, the place you usually really need it is the final, what is now traditionally the annual review. There's still usually a summary final performance review of the year that happens before pay decisions and conversation. Um, that's usually when you have to have the nuts and bolts pretty tight by, um, but everything leading up to that, I, I would keep it pretty loose and simple unless you need to tighten that up to increase compliance or for legal or process issues. Yeah, kind of on an individual company by company basis. Very I know much. for me as a manager, I need some notes because I will forget by November what maybe what I said in February, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. You want it happening, right? You want it to happen in a well-informed. Yeah. That's the, that's no. the first, the first hurdle yeah. to clear. And I need some accountability just to remind me in Correct. some cases of, you know, if, if I have 25 employees that I'm working with, I may need some, well, you know, I may need some help remembering. To that point with your personal documentation, that's the thing is if you don't pick up from your previous conversation, now these are becoming inauthentic and going through the hoops, right? So, I mean, you, you, you at least need enough as a manager yeah. or a leader to make sure it is con- it's, there's continuity there. Right? Yeah. Consistent, continuous, re, you know, fair from that standpoint of triggering what I'm the, the conversation I had. So I remembered accurately uh, for, for okay. my, for my sake. Okay. As we kind of bring this in for landing, we th- we're going to think about this third part in kind of a no brainer, but n- maybe not a no brainer that these need to be developmental. What does that mean? Yeah, you know that's yeah. It sounds it sounds easy, right? But like when you think about what is development, there's there's the part that people miss is improving performance is development, right? And making goal progress, improving um, on the way I approach my job every day, learning every day is development, right? So like these should be developmental in that way when they're achievement oriented, when they're future oriented. We're developing because we're um, harvesting lessons. We're talking about how to get better. We're making a plan for the future. So in in that way that's where performance reviews have probably traditionally been most efficient. And then there's the more traditional sense of development when we think about um, like career pathing and having a plan for um, what, what steps need to happen to determine my next achievement, whether that's um, experience, key experiences, skills, training, um, getting promoted, you know, what, what's my clear developmental path. You, you need both of those. So, I mean, the, the one they miss really is the, how do we make the um, lessons harvested more developmental, identifying barriers and opportunities? And then the one that we do but probably don't do well enough is the development planning. And uh, frankly, a lot of times the development planning is a second class citizen, an afterthought, if you will. They don't; Those goals don't get taken as seriously as your performance goals. And, and that's a mistake. We can get some... Uh, we can get some team clues to how they're feeling through our Q12 and maybe some questions like someone cares about me. What else in the Q12? What would be some clues from a team perspective uh, on those kind of questions of are are we are we being more developmental than less? What do you think? Well, my, my quick answer is obviously going to be your your, uh, your uh, Q12 survey data, right? I mean, that's one way right away is when we have scheduled action planning around things we care about. I mean, right. that'll be something that'll jump out in your data right away. Uh, another thing is if you're you're losing stars, either they're going to other teams, um, not because they did great and they're ready for the next step, but they were looking for something else. Um, or, or you're just having turnover in general. So turnover is often tied to development. It's a very, it's a top predictor of, I think it's one or two in predicting ter- um, turnover. So development's an issue there. The other thing, I'm trying to think of what you hear from a team too. Um, you might hear a lot of conversation about opportunity for improvement. Mm. We could be better, or I'd like, you know, I'd like to explore this. Or when you're starting to hear a lot of problems, 
a lot of times the answer there is often actually a form of development. Um, yeah. Would there be another question in the Q12? I was, I was thinking through, uh, we have a development question in there talking about it, you know, or even question three, I get the opportunity to do what I do best yep, every totally. day, right? Uh, kind of that indicator. Um, how do you feel about managers maybe using in the developmental review? Can I just pull that question three out as a manager? We're going to talk about questions here in just a second. But can I pull that question out and just ask it? It's a tricky so question. Think? So obviously for the one-on-one, -on -one, we don't have their individual data, right? right. So that's right. not available. Now, if you're in a team progress review, we could talk about whether the team's high or low on it, what it means, but there's no reason we can't have a conversation around it. I mean, the Q12 really should be a framework for talking about work and your needs. So we don't have to sit there and talk about scores, but you know, one thing we do in our um, progress reviews is we teach managers to work through those needs of employees from expectations to do best, to um, am, I, am I the manager talking about development often enough? Um, do you feel like you have opportunities to learn and grow? So, I mean, if you can incorporate Q, the Q12 into your performance conversations, I, it, it means you're naturally, if you're living engagement every day in that way, you're naturally having these conversations about um, is your development good? And the employee should feel more empowered to say, hey, um, I could work on my learn and grow a little bit right now, or I could use a little more developmental feedback, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I hear that conversation a lot at Gallup because we live that uh, a couple times a year where we talk about it all the time. I actually find us phrasing questions that way to say, uh, you know, I mentioned this in the very beginning of the show, Q10, best friend at work. That I say that all the time to employees I work with so that they know, hey, you're very valuable to me as a, as a friend because yep. that's important in our data. Adam, uh, we've got some questions to help coaches, help managers or managers. What kind of questions could we ask uh, during this phase? Yeah, great. Jim, you're my best friend at work. I just want to say that. Um, <laughs> I've said it and I can check it off my don't, list. Don't tell Micah I, I, I said that. Don't <laughs> tell Micah I said that. <laughs> okay, great. Um, with, with the idea that effective progress reviews help employees sustainably grow and improve, that's the pitch. That's the anchor we're going for in this piece. Here's some questions asked with that. Who encourages your development? Getting back to that part of power of two, who else in the company really helps you shine, can help you really land the point where if I know I need to communicate something or if I want to make sure I've communicated enough or more or less, Jim's my call, right? High communication, I know he thrives in this space. We were just commenting on prior to the show, uh, his involvement in the Facebook community, and it's just, I have high competition. I would like to beat Jim to the point to be able to answer the questions. It's never going to happen. I, just, I can't, so I won't compete, Jim. It's all you. A um, couple more here. Are there mentors in an organization who you'd like to spend more time with? I'm going to give you my point of view on this one, and, and it's backed up by years of Don Clifton saying and making sense of experience. If you've got high competition, you probably have found yourself doing this, where you get into an organization and you find who the players are. And instead of just competing with them, I try and look to download as much as I can from them. Mentors are so beneficial and, and useful in a way that I wish we, we could do more of that and talk more about it, write more about it, and we should. But for you as coaching managers, coaching individuals, coaching leaders, right, are they setting that up? Are they doing that? And, you know, do you need a full-fledged mentorship program? Sometimes they help to get started. But it's a good nudge in these conversations to say, like, that's, that's cur you know, curious you want to develop yourself and SVSS. I'd like to introduce Dr. Ben Wigger to help you out with learning statistical process control along the way. I'll never call you for that, Ben. Um, but it's those types of conversations you can have that it's a quick fix that encourages their development. Two more here. Have you received meaningful feedback in the last week? If so, why was it meaningful to you? The bias in that question is we assume it's meaningful because we're giving it to you and like, hey, we're, we are in the manager role, we're in the leader role, so it's going to be great. But unless you stop and ask that question, is it meaningful? How do you even know if it's meaningful? For example, um, Scott Miller, if you've probably heard me mention in past on these as well, we've had that conversation and where, you know, he knows from the start, metrics are metrics, I'll see them and he'll see them, we know that. Just get to the, the point of what do we need to focus on the most. So we, we almost skip the first part of that conversation, not because we don't enjoy it or we don't want to. I've just said what's most meaningful for me in the time period that we have in 24 hours, which we had way more hours in the day, uh, let's just cut right to it, right? right? What's, what's, the, what's the feedback look like going forward? What are, what's that, that's most meaningful to me. And then the last one here, 
are there barriers to achieving your well-being goals? I put this one in here because right now burnout, you know, you've got one of the, the gurus on, on here with us to talk through that. But also that well-being doesn't just stop in the workplace. It goes all the way around. And this is not a progress review that in, in developmental uh, conversation that has to stop there. It's how else can you help accomplish those other aspects of well-beings? I'll, I'll end with this, Jim, and back to you. This is one of those conversations that you can't wing it. I love when Jim said that I've got to have some commerce and pieces going into it because you should, this should feel very prepared and almost you can, you could hear, you know, if you study athletes, if you ask them, what are they doing pre pre game? They're playing the game through their head. They're running the plays, right? Use these questions. That's your pre game. Get prepared for what possibly they could answer with. So you're well and prepared to hit all three points throughout. Ben, anything you would add? I would, I would just round it off saying if you can answer the question or you can get them to answer the question, what do you want your future to look like in one year, in three years, in five years, we can start to paint a picture of how of how we get there, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll just reiterate what Adam said. We study um, how managers and employees approach development. Um, employees often want the manager to give them their options and tell them what's possible. And the manager also often wants to know, you know, what what would make you happy? What do you think you would be good at? And they have to come together on that conversation because if the employee just expects the manager to be psychic, we have a problem. And if if the manager just expects the employee to know what their development should look like, we have a problem. So they need to meet, meet halfway. Ben, we originally wrote this article uh, for this the COVID situations going on, causing massive disruption around the world. On top of that, here in the United States, uh, we've had a lot of diversity questions kind of come up over the last couple of weeks. When we think about this area in the area of diversity and even in disruption, which I, you know, COVID just created global disruption uh, in that, what, what kind of final advice would you give, especially in the area of diversity? Sure. I'm gonna, I'll take the softball COVID first, then hit yeah. diversity. So COVID has been a very interesting experiment in performance management because anybody who's not going to have their performance conversation, that's, that's a vote of no faith in your process because you can't not have the, you, you may not measure to it or, or pay to it like you normally would, but skipping the conversation at a time when employees um, need some confidence of what's happening and we need to be talking to each other is not a good thing, right? So in the time of COVID, the things that become more important than, or any disruption become more important than ever are agile goals. Are we prepared to pivot and have conversations about pivoting? Um, ongoing meaningful conversations. Are we staying in touch both for the sake of engaging your workforce and making good decisions and then adjusting accountability in the way that makes sense. So obviously um, the the performance metrics or pay may need to be adapted because of current situations, right? So that, that's my response to the COVID aspect of it. Um, that's where we need to double down. And anyway, what what better time to kind of burn the boats on your old way of doing performance management than when, when you have to do it differently now. Um, in regard to the inclusivity um, question, where performance management really plays in there is um, this is where opinions count is required, right? Required. So if you don't begin a two-way dialogue where you're listening to your employees and having a two-way conversation here, um, this is this is literally the place where opinions officially count on paper, right? So that needs to be an inclusive conversation and people need to feel like um, they're being heard and things are being individualized to them. The other thing I'd say about performance management is obviously this is tied to promotion and pay, which is tied to where the root of many diversity issues are of who's getting paid and promoted. Um, you you can track that through your data, right? You can, you can see who has equal pay, unequal pay is promoted um, at at different rates than other classes, right? So those are the two things. I mean, the conversation should promote inclusivity in general and opinions count. And this is where you gotta watch the decisions you're making through as a result of these performance reviews is affecting who's getting paid and promoted. So that that's, that's something you should keep an eye on. Those three topics of disruption, diversity, and inclusion are not going away. Like they're, they're here, they're here to stay. They've actually always been here. Uh, we've been talking about them uh, for a while. They're in our data. We have, as we as we do research on them, uh, we publish and post just as fast as we can to get that information out there and provide the webcasts like we do here. Um, but 
th those are those are not and i hope actually they don't go away because that they're the they're the core problems a lot of times organizations face and so while that's happening today and this information is applicable to today it will be applicable a year from now and two years from now and 10 years from now because we we need to struggle for better uh better impact in those areas yeah. adam anything else you'd add before i i wrap it up no i think those are all great points and well said Ben, anything else that I missed in this? Like how you concluded on, you know, it's an opportunity to do to do better and to do the right thing. Um, these are things we should always be working on, and um, we should grab the momentum and, and push hard. Yeah, no, I'm I'm hoping so, and we've got a great platform to be able to do this. I'm going to thank both of you for your work in this at Gallup. It's great, uh, Ben, with your eight years of work here with us, Adam, with you helping me surface all this content to to make it available. Um, for individuals, uh, coaches, managers uh, around the around the globe, thank to, thank you to both of you for joining me today and being a part of this, and uh, and appreciate it. With that, we'll remind everyone to take full advantages of all the resources we have available on our website. If you go to gallup.com, we do have a special workplace section. A lot of this stuff gets uh, surfaced in our workplace practice, and it's it's strength laden. So if you think, oh no, I'm a strengths coach, well, no, actually, you're a workplace coach because that's where strengths happen. And so uh, don't don't miss some of our workplace section. If you wanna kind of keep up with all the things that Adam is doing and posting and that team is doing over there, they are rocking it lately. So go to gallup.com, uh, use the search button while you're there. Many of the topics can be surfaced that way as well. And we'd love to have you do that. Specifically strengths related, go to gallup.com slash CliftonStrengths, can log into access directly from there and we continue to push more content that way into our access platform as well. If you're on any of those pages, you can you can sign up for the Clifton Strengths Community Newsletter. We do that once a month. Great way to stay connected to us. And actually, we've got all kinds of newsletters. Uh, just take a look when you're out there. Alerts and the ability to kind of keep up with everything that we're doing out on our site as well. If you have any questions on anything, you can send us an email, coaching at gallup.com. If you want to follow our live events, maybe it's the first time you've joined us live and you're like, oh man, this was great. I want to see... I want to see more of Adam and Ben. Okay, well then, let, one, let us know. But two, uh, follow us, gallup.eventbrite.com um, as well. We just finished up a very popular virtual summit that happened in the 2021 summit now is open if you want to join us next year for that. And maybe you're listening to this and it's just a couple months away. Uh, head out to gallupatwork.com and you can see everything that's going on for 2021. And actually the agenda uh, has already been announced and is out there. So Gallup at work. Dot com. Join us in Facebook, facebook.com slash group slash call to coach on LinkedIn. Maybe you're not a Facebooker and that's okay. On LinkedIn, you can join us uh, just by searching Clifton Strengths Trained Coaches. We want to thank you for joining us today. We'll hang out for a smidgen of a post show if you're joining us live. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody.